Hey, this is Brock Lemires, and in this video I'm going to continue talking about computer terminology, and this time we're going to focus on computer software. So we've talked about how a computer is a collection of hardware and software that work together to perform a task. In the computer hardware, it consists of all the circuitry that is designed to execute a set of instructions and the instructions are specific to that particular computer. Software is the act of taking the instruction codes and putting them in a particular sequence so that you, when executed, they perform a more complica complicated task. And the act of putting those instructions in sequence and the and designing them to repeat or jump over other instructions is called the program development or software development. So if you look at uh, computers, there's kind of two approaches to building a computer. One is where you build the CPU or control unit to have a lot of different instructions. So hundreds of instructions and each of them can perform like a very complicated task. So you almost have like one instruction for everything you could ever imagine. That's called a complex instruction set computer or CISC. So it's a large number of instructions. And the alternative of that, to that is called a risk in risk computer, which is called a reduced instruction set computer. And so that would just have like a handful of instructions. So if you look at like the way that would be implemented within this fetch decode execute state diagram is you still fetch just like always, you still decode just like always. It's just that the number of paths that are implemented for each instruction down here changes. So in a reduced instruction set computer, a risk, you would have fewer fewer paths for each instruction. And then in a CISC, you'd have a lot of different paths. And the idea is that in a RISC, the approach is basically that the control unit circuitry is going to be overall smaller. And smaller circuits in digital systems tend to run faster because they have less capacitance, there's less, there's less distance for the signals to travel, and you can clock them at a faster rate. So the idea is that you implement a smaller number of instructions, but you run them quicker and you can perform the same amount of information. A CISC takes the approach that you're basically just going to, you can have circuitry that runs uh, slower, but it doesn't matter because each instruction is so powerful that it can outperform a risk. So those are the two terms that you hear when you talk about like instruction sets of a particular computer. Okay, so <clears throat> If you look at types of instructions, regardless of RISC or CISC, there's basically classes of instructions and there's three general classes. So you are gonna have instructions that are called data movement instructions. And these are just instructions that move information back and forth between the memory system and the IO to registers in the CPU. So if you bring information from the memory system into a uh, register, we tend to call that a load or a move. And if you move information from a register out into the memory system, we tend to call that a store or a uh, another move. And this is a very common thing because you can think about you're bringing in information, you're manipulating it and sending it out. So there's instructions that handle just moving it back and forth between memory. Okay, the other class of instructions <clears throat> is called data manipulation instructions. And these are instructions that use the ALU. So this is where you bring information into the CPU registers using a data movement instruction, and then you're gonna manipulate it. So you're either gonna add the numbers together, you're gonna subtract them, you're gonna shift them, you're gonna perform a logic operation, but that instruction is implemented with logic that sits in the ALU. Okay, so the circuitry to do <clears throat> the actual operation has to already reside, reside in here. So when you design an instruction, you have to also put the corresponding circuitry in the ALU. And so when you pull open a computer data sheet, it'll tell you what instructions are actually in the ALU or what are used to do data manipulation. And then you have the third class, which is called program flow instructions. And this is where, you know, we talked about a program being a sequence of instruction that sits in data or excuse me, program memory. And that's true. <laughs> the trick though, is that you're going to execute these one by one. And at some point, you're gonna just keep going. So the program counter is gonna be incrementing through program memory, pointing to the next instruction, pointing to the next instruction, and you'll just keep going out the end of the memory space and the computer will crash. 
And so you need ways to take the program counter and at least at a minimum move it back up to the beginning of the program so that you could loop forever. And you could also use these program flow instructions to essentially you're incrementing sequentially and then all of a sudden you jump over a set of instructions and then you might jump back and then you might jump way forward. So this gives you the ability to do conditional program flow instructions so that you can selectively execute code. And that's how you implement like a if else statement or a switch case statement that we will learn about. Okay. So there's kind of unconditional program flow instructions, which basically say, once you get down to this location, you're always going to move the program counter back up to another location. And then conditional is where you say, I will only move the program counter somewhere else if a condition is true. Now you might say, how do I know what conditions I can look at? That right there is over in the status register. So your carry flags, your negative flags, zero flags, and your two's complement flags can be looked at. And you say, if there was a carry, go ahead and move the program counter way down here. So those that's the third class of instructions. Okay, when you look at an instruction code or an instruction, it is made up of two fields. The first is called an opcode, and you can have like something that's a move instruction, but it has to be assigned a unique binary code. So the code that it's given is called an opcode, which stands for an operation code. And these are, you know, binary codes that you can look up. However, when you reference an instruction, you typically want to use some sort of name. And so we use the term mnemonic to be a descriptive name of the opcode. So instead of saying, I wanna run instruction hex AA, you would say, I wanna run instruction add register zero to register one. And so you'd have like add R0, R1. So it's a mnemonic. And you can actually program at the mnemonic level. So if you sit there and you basically just open a text editor and you start typing in the mnemonics of instructions, you can essentially program it in what we call assembly. Assembly is a technique to, to program a computer at a very low level. You are essentially programming at the instruction level, but you're using the mnemonics of the instructions instead of the actual binary codes. You could actually program a computer by writing down the binary codes that go into program memory. That would be called programming a computer in binary. If you instead use the mnemonics and you would be programming an assembly. So in order to take assembly language, which is basically the mnemonics for each instruction, and convert it into the binary codes, there's a tool called an assembler. So that basically just translates the mnemonic for each instruction into its corresponding binary code to go into program memory. Okay, some instructions require additional information beyond the opcode, and we call that the operand. So for example, if you were gonna say, I want to move information from register zero out to an address in memory, well, the the memory address is kind of a variable within the instruction. So that is something that's not hard coded into the opcode. That's something you provide as additional information along with the instruction. And we call that the operand. And so a lot of times it's, it's addresses. Uh, a lot of times it's telling which registers are going to be used in the operation, but it's anything that's supplemental to the actual opcode itself. Okay, so here's like an example of what an instruction might look like in assembly. So let's say you had a mnemonic to move information and you said it's going to move it from the source to a destination. So the source could be a register, the destination could be a register, the, the source could be an address in memory, the destination could be an output port. But this is a type of syntax you would see at an assembly level program. This is the mnemonic, and that will be translated directly into an opcode, and these are the operands, and these are additional information that are needed by the instruction. Here's an example of a, this, this move would be a data manipulation instruction. Here, or excuse me, a data movement instruction. This would be an example of a data manipulation instruction. You're gonna add two numbers, and you're gonna take the source, add it to the destination, and then usually the instruction will tell you where the result's gonna go, okay? So it might go into the destination. So you take source plus destination, put the sum in the destination, and they tell you this in the, in the data sheets, and they use kind of a higher level uh, description of it. So they don't talk about 
the actual op code for the ad instruction, they just say ADD. And that's like, well, I knew that mnemonic meant ad. And you, again, you just look this up in the data sheet. Uh, there are instructions that don't need a lot of operands. For example, you could say increment, and then you'd have a destination. The destination could be a register. It could be a piece of information in, in data memory. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, those are the instructions that assembler. Now, the true power of programming a computer comes when you can do it at a little bit higher level. And so when you program in assembly, you're at a very low level, okay? And that's good for like microcontrollers and stuff like that where you're controlling a motor or you're really simple. But there is a language called C, which is very powerful in that you can program a computer using a, a more almost like algorithmic description of what you want to happen, such as actually typing out if this is true, then do this, else do something else. And continually repeat these instructions while this condition is true. So the syntax is higher level and that can, can basically builds a programming language. And what we're gonna do is learn about the language C. Now, when you program at a higher level, you need a way, you're not giving it these specific instruction mnemonics, you're giving it like high level syntax, like if else and while and for loops and stuff like that. So you need a different piece of software to convert that to the actual program binaries. And that is called a compiler. So a compiler takes the high level language written in a language like C and converts it to the instruction binaries. Okay, again, the lower level version of that is the assembler. Now, there's another process that takes place when you run all this together, okay? And that is called a linker. And usually all these steps are kind of combined into one like command that you run. So you write your, your source code or your program. And if you write it in a language like C, you'll run a compiler. The compiler will actually call another tool called a linker. And what a linker does is it brings in a bunch of extra information that is needed by your program to actually form what we call the executable. The executable is the actual instruction binaries that are put into the computer memory, in the program memory, <clears throat> and then you tell the program counter to go there and start executing it. So in when you, especially when you program at a high level, you're always calling built-in functions and you need to know what those functions are. So you'll be accessing information from these libraries that we include. And the linker is what pulls the information together and forms this unified inst unified inst executable. <clears throat> and the linker also pulls information about where can this program actually go as it passes it to the operating system, okay? All right, then you have something called a debugger, which allows you to actually step your program individually, instruction by instruction, and check out what's going on in memory. So here's a couple graphs that kind of show how this looks. Let's say that you start with a program file that you've written in C. You're gonna give it an extension .c, so you'll have something called main.c. You'll then run a compiler, but the compiler has to know information about the CPU. So it has to know what it's going to convert your C code into in terms of the available instructions within the CPU. So once it pulls in the information about the actual CPU it's targeting, then what it does is it creates essentially an assembly file. So it has the program binaries and then it can actually create a file that has the associated mnemonics and you can look at how your C program was converted into individual instructions that will then go into memory. From there, you can run an assembler to convert it to the final binary file that's all linked and can be put into memory, okay? All right. Once you get that, you have to get it down into the computer. So there's this thing called a programmer or a loader, and it downloads it into the program memory of the computer, and you're off and running. The debugger lives as a kind of a back door into the actual computer hardware, and it allows you to watch the CPU registers and the addresses and the information in memory as you execute your program. Now your program's running super fast, so you do this by stepping the instructions. So you'll say like, okay, run instruction one, and now stop, and let me see what happened in the CPU registers, and let me see what's in memory, and let me see what's in the status flags. Then you're like, okay, I wanna run another instruction. So you run instruction 
Revelation 2. Then you go look at what happened in the registers and you look at what happened and everything. And you can then use it to debug your software. Okay, that is an overview of computer software in terms of the terminology and kind of the language that we use to develop our programs. All right, see ya.